no further ado, we will like to introduce a very talented man with a very, uh, quite an amazing story. Dr. Amelchuk graduated from the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Alberta, Canada in 1962. Um, he's practiced medicine for over 25 years and was president of the, of the College of Family Physicians of Alberta chapter. He was the chief of staff at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton, Canada, teaching staff of the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Alberta. He was British Airways Medical Officer for Al the Alberta region. He was a member of North American Aerospace Medical Association and of the Canadian Society of Adi Aviation Medicine. He's extensively studied recent progress in brain injury. Um, you will hear from his story why that came about. And his name and bibliography is also listed in the international who's who of medicine in the 1987 edition. You don't get credentials much better than that anywhere in the world. So I'd like you to welcome Dr. Alex Amelchuk. Well, thank you, Glenn. I want to talk a little bit about how these products, and, and this will come more and more in, in, in this afternoon, how we can incorporate these products in our daily lives and why they are so important. And the allopathic medical community, the research community, has accepted a lot of this, but not so much in the medical aspect, but at the scientific level. There's no question there's absolutely no question at all of the benefits of glyconutritionals, monosaccharides, phytosterols, phytochemicals, uh, all these products or all these supplements that we're talking about. In fact, last year, in January of last year, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology had awarded the Scripps Institute in Southern California $34 million to provide what is a acceptable research and the research into these products. Also in Canada, there's a medical school called McMaster that's in Ontario, the province of Ontario. They have last year announced that they're going to fund and build a research facility to the tune of $100 million to study complementary care and, and nutritional supplementation as far as medicine goes. So this is going to come about and it is going to uh, become involved more and more at the level of the medical practitioner. And the prediction I make is that, you know, physicians who don't listen now for whatever reason, I'll go into that a little bit more, will actually be forced to listen because it is going to get to the day that unless a physician advises, unless a healthcare professional advises that there are other therapies, other benefits that can be accrued through nutrition rather than the standard drug paradigm, they will be the ones that will be held accountable. Right now, and this happens in Canada, it happens in the States, it happens here, doctors are, the open-minded doctors, the doctors that, that will uh, take the effort to learn about these nutritional uh, benefits are actually criticized and uh, there, there's a very publicized case here in, in Australia. Uh, in my own practice, when I was in practice many years ago, I was actually called up on the carpet and my license was threatened three times. I spent too much time with patients according to the medical association, the equivalent of your medical board. We have what is called a college that overlooks the type of practice one does. I spent too much time I spent too much investigative procedures, and it costs the paying agency, and you, you have socialized medicine here as we do in Canada, my cost per patient because of these, this time and effort and uh, investigation that I did in patients was 87 cents per patient per year and more than it was allowable. And they actually threatened to pull my license on three different occasions because as one doctor says in, in, in this one little interrogation we had where they were investigating me, he literally stood up on the end of this big table and he says, what the heck makes you think you're better than the rest of us, doctor? You know, I don't know why. Trying to help people 
and they, they say you're not doing a good job. I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. I also want to say that I am not an employee of any company. I'm an independent speaker. Uh, I Obviously, I have to make a living and I get a speaking fee, but I'm not tied to any corporation. I'm not paid by any uh, corporation at all. I want to tell you very briefly uh, my story and how I got uh, interested in these uh, glyconutritionals. As Glenn was saying, I was, I was a busy boy. I was running a thousand bed teaching hospital. I was the chief of staff. I was all these other things that Glenn mentioned. I did surgery, which means you know physical surgery. I did obstetrics. I ran an office. My, my, and, and in the evenings, and I was one of these old time family docs that uh, I did house calls. I did a few other things. And in the evenings, I mean, all the people that wanted to see me couldn't get into my office in the daytime. So in the evening, my wife and I ran a satellite clinic. So I was working virtually 80 hours a week, and I was on call 24-7, and I was doing obstetrics, which means I was up in the middle of the night many times, but I loved my work. I, I was helping people, and this was my <laughs> chosen field, and I really, really liked doing what I was doing, and I thought I was perfectly healthy. But I did forget one very important fact. Just because you have no symptoms doesn't mean you are disease-free. I thought I was disease-free, and at 10.44 p.m. on November the 5th of 1987, I didn't have a care in the world. You know, I exercised, I ran my dog, my wife and I ran a clinic. You know, and when your dog loves you and runs with you and you have a good wife, I mean, what else can you ask for in life? This <laughs> is fantastic. So anyway, uh, things, things were going really good. At 10.45 p.m., my life was suddenly shattered. I suffered an excruciating pain in the back of my head. It was a, a vessel in the right middle cerebellar artery, one of the major vessels to the back of the head, ruptured, and I suffered an extensive intracranial bleed, or a ruptured aneurysm. When this happened, it was like somebody hit you on the back of the head with a baseball bat, and I, I guess here they call them cricket bats or whatever, it was, it was painful. It was excruciating pain, you just can't imagine how much. And I was getting ready to bed and then this happened and I said, I told my wife, I said, call an ambulance, I've just had an aneurysm. And she looked at me and at first she didn't believe me, then she saw the color draining out and I knew what was going to happen. I knew I was going to pass out shortly, and I knew I was going to start throwing up. I knew I was going to lose control of all my bodily functions and everything else. And my wife called the ambulance, and they came promptly and got me into the hospital. And it was, by that time, I was comatose, but she said it was like a scene from the show ER, emergency room, a TV show. Everybody was there, including all the best surgeons, acute care people, emergency care physicians, nurses, doctors because I was chief and they were going to look after me. And, and they did, they stabilized me. Next day, I underwent approximately nine hours of delicate brain surgery to reconnect everything in my head and make me whole again, if you would. It took me about a week or so to eventually wake up. I was on intensive care, I was on life support, and in fact, every day there was a bulletin printed in the doctor's lounge, and I didn't find out about this till a couple of years ago. It said, Dr. Malchuk, in coma, near death, not expected to survive. And that's, that's the way my, my life was at the time. However, again, Western medicine is fantastic, second to none, as far as acute care, surgical care, traumatic care, emergency physician care and so forth, they do fantastic work and they did save my life. Again, with the best of therapies, everything else, rehabilitation, I eventually you know, got more mobile. But when I first woke up, when I was uh, on intensive care, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I couldn't express myself. Virtually, I, was, I could just lay there. But through the therapies and everything else, I my rehabilitation was fantastic. I was in, in hospital rehab for a number of months and eventually I just carried on with the rehab on my own. However, I, I did have persistent difficulties. One of them is acute, unrelenting, terrible, 
excruciating, you can't say enough adjectives, head pain. And if anybody has suffered a stroke or closed head injury or knows somebody that has, one of the major things is head pain. This head pain persisted and it was unrelenting. I would take all kinds of medication and the names are different, but the narcotic medications, dihydrocodone, Demerol, the anti-inflammatory medications, the, the uh, Toradols, the Naprosins, the uh, Fioranol, Fioranol C, uh, Percocet, Percodan, all these things I was taking and nothing would relieve the pain. It would dull it for a while, but nothing would really relieve it. This went on for years and years and years. In fact, 12 years after my uh, unfortunate incident with the ruptured aneurysm, I was still on this medication to the point where I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I would have to have this medication. My wife would give it to me and then, bless her soul, she'd sit up at night because I was taking so much medication that I was in danger of overdosing. She'd sit up and watch me to make sure that I was still, still uh, breathing. And this went on. I had other disabilities, short-term memory, long-term memory, cognitive disabilities, paresthesias from my knees down where I, I couldn't feel where my feet were going. I would, consequently, I'd fall down a lot. And you know, really, I got fairly good at falling down. I, I could fall down 10 times a day, get up and carry on and scare the heck out of people along a sidewalk or wherever. I mean, they'd see me falling down, they'd want to help me, but I'd get up. and carry on. I'm, I'm a stubborn sort of a, a, a persistent guy. I was alive, but I had no quality of life. If you can believe, I was using up to $6,000 worth of medication every year just to control my symptoms. I couldn't do any work. I was totally disabled. I was classed as, as being totally disabled. And, you know, I went to my doctors and I knew what they were going to say. Well, kind of get used to it, Alex. You know, you've come about as far as you're going to go. You can drive a car now. I mean, yeah, you have problems. You can't work, but uh, yeah, you've got a little disability pension. So, you know, get used to it. You'll, you're going to live this way the rest of your life. And these weren't just ordinary physicians. These were some of the best physicians in North America telling me that I would never get better again. And you know, I was doing some volunteer work and a secretary came to me one day and she, she saw how it was. I'd, I'd do about an hour, sometimes two hours of volunteer work, then I had to lie down before I could even drive home. And she said to me one day, she says, uh, Alex, uh, would you like to feel better? And I looked at her and I says, yeah, why would I want to feel better? I'm fine. Hey, this is okay. So anyway, uh, I said, yeah, but uh, what are you going to do about it? And this, remember, this is a secretary. She has no medical training whatsoever. She says, well, I've got something here that might help you. And I thought to myself, you know, is this woman nuts? <laughs> She's telling me what is going to help me. I've got the best physicians in the world looking after me, and she's telling me she's got something that these physicians don't know after 12 years. And I said, well, I'm desperate. I really wanted something to help me. So I says, well, yeah, what, what, what are you trying to sell me? <laughs> and she said, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but would you look at this? It might help you. So I said, sure. Yeah, so I looked at it, and I went to, the, you know, to all the university research sites I could get, all the scientific sites on the computer. I researched it for a couple of months, and then I talked it over with my wife, and we said, well, you know, if this stuff does what it's supposed to do or what they say it does, I want to try it because nothing else is working. I've tried all the therapies. I've tried all the usual therapies, the allopathic therapies, the hypnotherapy, the psychotherapy, everything you can think of. And I forgot to mention earlier that they did neuropsychological testing on me in the process of my rehab, and they said I had lost 30% of my functional brain capacity. So this person is telling me that she's going to help me, and I, I thought, well, I'm skeptical as heck. I mean, all the training I've ever had, nothing is, nothing is going to work. There's, there's nothing in the world that's going to help me, but I'm desperate. So I, I said, well, you know, I'd like to try this. In a couple of weeks, I started taking these supplements. I started having a little more energy. I thought, my gosh, you know, I sleep a little bit better. I, I have pain, but not quite as much pain. I, I have a little bit better balance. 
you know, I, before I couldn't stand up on one leg. Now, you know, <laughs> Max tells the story, and I'm, I'm a little embarrassed about this. I, I had to sit down to put on my trousers, because if I tried to put on my trousers standing up, I'd fall over. So all this stuff started improving. About four and a half months after I started these products, I woke up one morning. Remember, I'd wake up every night with pain, with unrelenting pain. I woke up one morning, I thought, man, it's about 7 o'clock in the morning. I had gone to bed the usual time, about eight or well, not nine, about nine, ten o'clock at night. I woke up this one morning and I had no pain. I hadn't gotten up that night to take any pain medication. And you know, and, and this is almost unbelievable. Since July, the last week of July of 2000, I have not even had to take an aspirin for pain. I have absolutely no pain whatsoever. That in itself would be <laughs> sufficient need or sufficient reason to take these products. However, my cognitive abilities have improved, my memory, short-term memory has improved, my long-term memory has improved, my stamina has improved. I couldn't work or be up more than about a couple hours at a time prior to starting these nutritional supplements. Just as an example, when Max and I first met, and I won't go into a long story about it, I was up for 36 hours straight. And Max says, I'll give you something, that we'll fix you. So he, and I, and I didn't know what he was going to give me, but he says, take these stuff, mix it with orange juice. And you know, I said, I can't take that much. I've never taken that much before. He says, so he put in a whopping big amount, give me some orange juice. <laughs> and it kept me up all night because of the energy it gave me for, for that day. And the worst part was the next day I was giving a six-hour seminar. And I said, My God, how can I do this? And this is about a year ago. After, I was on the product about a year and a half then. And so he fixed me up another one of these uh, cocktails. <laughs> I, I worked all day, we did a full seminar, and I was still going that night. And as further illustration of how much energy I have now, I just found out I was coming here a couple of weeks ago, and the airplanes, you know, it's a 24-hour, 23-hour airplane ride then with, with uh, sitting in airports and connections and everything else. I left, or the last sleep I had, this week was Monday morning, which would be Monday evening, your time. I have not seen a bed for over 48 hours, closer to 50 hours. I got here Thursday morning, and we didn't go to bed that day till about 9 o'clock, and then last night, I mean, I was on the go for over 48 hours, and I was still functional. Two years ago, I couldn't function two hours without having to rest. I mean, these products have absolutely, absolutely done amazing things for me. And you know, I don't know what you guys think, you haven't heard, and I, 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 I hope most of you will come and listen to me this afternoon when we spend a couple of hours talking about the science, but you know, from being 30% functional brain capacity, loss of functional brain capacity of 30%, I don't know how, how you guys think, but I sure don't think I'm 30% brain dead at the, at the state I'm at now. So it's, it's giving me my life back. I, just to break the, 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 the seriousness of this, I want to tell you a little story. And I, I heard this story from a grand lady in Colorado a few months ago. She was about 78 or 79 years old, very nice person. And she says, you know, I'd like to tell you a story, and whether this is true or not, I don't know, but it seems there's this older couple, Harold and Molly. Harold went to the doctor one day and says, you know, Doc, um, I'm not sure my wife hears very well. You know, I talk to her and she doesn't respond to me. I don't know what's wrong, but uh, could you see her? And the doc says, well, yeah, I'll, I'll examine her, but I have no time today, so I'll tell you a little test you can do at home. So Harold agrees, so he says, the doc says to him, he says, stand your wife over at one end of the house and come back about 50 feet and say something, see if she'll respond. So Harold goes home and puts his wife at one end of the house and he walks back about 50 feet and he says, Molly, uh, what are we having for dinner tonight? No response. He walks up 10 feet closer and he says, Molly, uh, what are we having for dinner tonight? No response. So he goes up 10 feet closer, no response, and so forth, until he gets right behind her ear. He says, Molly, uh, 
What are we having for dinner tonight? He says, for God's sakes, Harold, I've told you five times we're having chicken. <laughs> You know, doctors many times, and I've run into this, and I'll tell you a true story. I, I practiced with a chap. I practiced with him for five or six years. He moved down to Phoenix. And he knows what condition I was in. We, were, we visited back and forth occasionally, and he knew I had the aneurysm and everything else. And we'd email each other, send us Christmas cards, and our wives would talk and so forth. And anyway, uh, we'll call him Joe. Joe knew that I had an aneurysm, and he knew all the troubles I went through and everything else. <laughs> so after I got interested in these nutritional supplements, I wrote Joe an email, and I says, well, you know, Joe, look at this stuff. Look what it's done for me. I've had, and I listed all the benefits and everything else. I got no response. And I didn't get anything back on my email saying, well, undeliverable or whatever, so I wrote him another email. Still no response, and you know, I figured, well, you know, certainly this must be something wrong here. Maybe he's not getting my emails, and sort of. And this was just before Christmas, so we sent him a Christmas card. My wife and I send Joel a Christmas card. But second week in January, I get my Christmas card back. Just crossed out, returned to, it doesn't say move, doesn't say anything. I thought, my gosh, this is strange. So I send Joel another email. Again, no response. This went on and on, and then next year, I sent Joel another Christmas card. This year, in January of this year, I got my Christmas card back. Now, I don't know what kind of a threat I've suddenly become to him, but you know, this is sometimes what physicians do. They, you know, I, I like a quote from Churchill. You know, we all know who Churchill was, and he says, every once in a while, men will stumble across something that's so revolutionary and life-changing they just pick themselves up and carry on as if nothing happened. <laughs> and that's, I guess that's what Joe is doing because, you know, you can condemn something if you look at it, if you professionally look at it, research it, find out what it's about. And then if you make up your mind saying it's no good or I don't believe in it or I don't want to know about it, that's fine. That's your professional opinion or your personal opinion. But to condemn something without even looking at it, that's the height of arrogance, you know. It's absolutely unfathomable to me why somebody would condemn something that has such great potential benefits. But in medical school, we are taught over and over again about the drug paradigm, that you know, nutrition has nothing to do with it, you know, you eat, and, you'll, and the previous speakers have mentioned that, you know, there's this, they, they just don't believe that nutrition has any place, but yet, as physicians, we are not taught anything about nutrition. And I, I want to show you this, because when I first read it, I, would, I, I just couldn't believe it. It says, nowadays, although few things tend to preoccupy us more constantly than what, what we ought to be eating or not eating, there are few subjects of less interest to medical curriculum planners than nutrition. No interest whatsoever in treating or teaching nutrition in medical school. And the, the editorial went on to say, for there's a long-standing belief that a healthful diet is merely a matter of common sense, I, lo I love this part, and need not be complicated by science. Doesn't that make sense? Forget about teaching it. You, you, know, you don't have to know anything about nutrition. And you think, well, gee, when was this printed? And that's obviously, it had to be 100 years ago. I mean. Certainly, medical schools wouldn't be that prejudiced in their views on nutrition in the, in the uh, now the 2,000 year of, of uh, since Christ. But, and this, this yeah, look at when it was printed. Or this was an editorial out of the Canadian Medical Association Journal, November the 10th, 2001. One year ago, this is the official position of medical schools and the Western medical schools are pretty well teach the same all over the world, be it Australia, be it Canada, the United States, Britain, and so forth. In 2001, they're still saying nutrition has no place in medicine or medical uh, 
school curricula or what, what have you. I mean, that, that I, I find that absolutely astounding. You know, way back over 2,000 years ago, 2,300 years ago, Socrates said, let your food be your medicine. Let your medicine be your food. That was correct then. It was correct thousands of years before that. It is correct today. And in fact, uh, Dr. Williams, Roger Williams, he is a PhD in nutrition, he said, you know, quite recently in 1971, he published a book, and he said the human body heals itself and nutrition provides the resources to accomplish this task. And that's true. Your body heals itself. All the drugs in the world don't heal anything. They mask symptoms, they, they block pain, but they do not heal. The only thing that can heal your body is what the divine has provided, and that is you, your own cells, your own body heals itself. You can mask symptoms and everything else, but when you give your body the proper tools, it has amazing capabilities of, of healing itself. And I'll go into, again, more of this, and I, I dearly love for all of you to come, because I, I just don't have time in a short lecture like this to go into all of the science, and we'll be spending uh, a couple of hours on this later on uh, in the afternoon. This is a, a chap, he's called Paracelsus, and he's basically the father of modern pharmacology. And he said, everything man needs to sustain good health is provided by God in nature, and it is the job of science to find it. And that is true, and people like my friend, and I've met him, he's a, a very pleasant chap, Dr. Bill McAnally, is one of the scientists who has found these things that are necessary uh, to maintain health. And we'll again go into that more and more as, as we, we uh, go on in the afternoon. One thing you have to remember is that if you don't take time for your health today, if you don't take time for your health today, you will be forced to take time for your sickness later. Prevention is everything. I mean, as Max said, we spend 90% of our health care dollars on the last couple of years of our lives. And you folks here and in the States, it's the same. In Canada, it's terrible. I was when I was part of the medical association running the hospital and involved with the uh, College of Family Physicians in Canada, we struck a committee to advise the then uh, health care uh, minister about what we thought the future of medicine would be. And we said, you know, it's going to become unbearably expensive. Governments are going to start chopping stuff off. They're not going to be paying for stuff, and the, the health care minister, all of Canada said, oh, no, 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 that will never happen. I mean, we'll always provide medicine. Well, and we said, you know, it's going to become prohibitively expensive, and we're going to have a shortage of doctors and all this sort of stuff. And he says, no, 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 we'll always provide money. Well, at that time, gross national product was approximately 7% into health care. This past year, in the province that I come from, which is like one of your states, province of British Columbia, the health care, total health care funding of the GNP in BC has now risen from 7%, it went up to 12 to 14%, went up to 18%, it went up to 24%. It is now presently taking 40% of our GNP in the province that I come from. The governments can't afford it. We're having all kinds of national debates how we're going to fund it and should we raise more taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And this is because there is nothing out there that is done for prevention. There's absolutely no training in nutrition, preventative medicine, and so forth in our medical schools. You know, things have gotten so bad on the drug paradigm that it, I'll, I'll show you this right away. Just in your own minds, guess what is the fourth leading cause of death. We know strokes and heart disease are terrible. We know that cancers take a lot of toll. We know, and this, this is the important one, 
the fourth leading cause of death is properly prescribed non-error adverse reactions to pharmaceutical drugs. Fourth leading cause of death, it kills over 100,000 people a year in the U.S. In Canada, we've got the same. It kills about you know, one-tenth of that. We have a tenth of the, the U.S. Uh, population. And you know, yet, our physicians, our medical schools, think that drugs are the only way to go. You know, you get the disease, come to us, we'll fix it. Well, every disease on this planet that's related to cellular integrity, cellular benefits, how the cells repair themselves, our immune systems are dropping and our disease rates are going up. And I work with a group in Canada called Canadian Nutrition for Kids. It's a charitable organization. And we do various research things into how the kids are doing their problems, their behavioral problems in school, ADD, ADHD, autism, uh, all these type of, type of things. And we're finding that only, you know, it's probably 2%, but the, the only real statistic we can validate is less than 12% of the kids actually eat a nutritious diet. And all these conditions are increasing. Autopsy studies done in Southern California show, I mean, we, we know heart disease is terrible, and we think it's a disease of older people, which it is in a sense. But at as early an age as two years, they are seeing, at the autopsy study, they are seeing beginning effects of cardiovascular disease. The worst part is, at five years of age, 100% of the kids that come to autopsy, for whatever reason, show second stage precursor heart disease. 100% of kids are showing foamy cell infiltration in their cardiovascular system, in their heart muscle, and in their arteries, and so forth. 100% of kids have second stage heart disease. Why isn't somebody doing something to prevent this? Why isn't somebody researching and jumping off of or yelling out from the highest building, let's do something? All the medicines that have been developed have done nothing to prevent heart disease. The incidence of heart disease is going up and up, and you know, for some of us that want to be complacent, the first sign of a heart attack is sudden death, so you really don't have time to reach for that bottle of aspirin or what, what have you that the, the pharmaceuticals want. I want to quote you something, and this is the cover of the Canadian Family Physician Journal, and this was printed September of this year. And they did an independent study of the effects of pharmaceuticals and the benefits of pharmaceuticals. And I, I quote, about 80% of new products or new clinical uses of drugs approved each year in the developed countries, which means Canada, US, Australia, and so forth, have no advantage whatsoever over existing drugs. 80% of the drugs you have out there that the pharmaceutical detail people and everybody else are saying, oh, this is wonderful stuff, have no therapeutic advantage. And it went on further to say only 2% of drug treatments offer any real advantage. 2% of all the drugs that are out there offer any real advantage to the patient. 5% have maybe some advantage. And this is the drug paradigm. I mean, yet, Allopathic medicine, and you wonder why I'm passionate about this? Allopathic medicine says pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical paradigm, that's the only way you can go. I mean, all this other stuff is snake oil. You're not gonna listen to that stuff, whatever. And yet, all the diseases are going up. Autism is going up, cardiovascular diseases are going up, strokes are going up, cancer is going up everything, all our chronic disease states are going up, uh, autoimmune diseases are going up, and yet, and we, can, we have research, and we have clinical reports, clinical studies showing that these can be benefited through nutrition, and yet the medical community, unfortunately, uh, doesn't, doesn't really want to, want to uh, listen to anything that is not uh, put out by the pharmaceutical companies. We all know what the genome is. That's where they study how many genes there are and how they transcribe information and so forth, genetic diseases, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's a new study emerging 
which comes from the glycobiology or glyco uh, information that's transmitted from one cell to another. It's called glynomics. And then that is the way that these glycoproteins interact from one cell to another cell. And you need eight of these sugars to interdigitate with each other. And this transcribes information from one cell to another. And they are finding now, and there's research being done on this, and it will, there are, there's some published, there'll be more published. They are finding now that sometimes the gene is okay. And there's about 35 to 40,000 genes. The gene is fine, but it's a transcription of the allele or the information transfer from one cell to another that is garbled because of missing glyconutrients or missing monosaccharides. And when you replace those monosaccharides, lo and behold, somehow that congenital disease, which is supposed to be never get better, suddenly starts improving. We've seen that in Tay-Sachs, we've seen that in Downs, we've seen that in Huntington's, we've seen that in many, many conditions. And in fact, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's, it's on the web, it's MD News, a medical update, and this is a picture of a little girl here with Down syndrome, and about three years on the products, or on the nutritional supplements, her whole facial features have improved I mean, this isn't supposed to happen. From being a typical Downs individual with limited mental capacity, she is now in a regular school. This isn't supposed to happen. The only difference is she is on glyconutrients. There are a number of things that are necessary for proper health. We know you need protein. We know you need vitamins and minerals now, although when I graduated, that was poo-pooed, same as uh, was said earlier. We know that you need essential acids. I mean, you don't need stuff that is uh, low in cholesterol or this, that, or the other thing. All the food, food manufacturers have stripped fat from their foods. They stripped the natural fats. They've put in hydrogenated oils. They've taken out cholesterol. And they say, this is good for you, and you eat this stuff, and you're going to have less heart disease and everything else. However, the Framingham study has definitely proven that the incidence of heart disease is going up and the cardiovascular diseases, the uh, hypertensions and everything is, is going up. And yet, you know, from eating low fat, low cholesterol, in North America, we've become the fattest people in the world. You know, we, we've, we've done everything. So again, we're not calorie deficient. We are nutrient deficient, and that's a big, big, big difference. The nutrients are supplied, or eight identified monosaccharides that are absolutely essential for every cell in your body. There are phytochemicals, phytonutrients, derived from ripened fruits and vegetables that your body needs to cleanse, repair, heal, and uh, antioxidants, and so forth. And then there are phytosterols. These are the missing link, these glyconutrients that are missing from our own bodies that is, I believe, have led to this crisis in health in our societies, where we're getting heart disease, we're getting more autoimmune diseases, we're getting all these, these other things that uh, literally we, we didn't suffer from uh, many years ago. At one lecture, somebody said, well, uh, if your stuff does so good, uh, how come the, you know, we're getting longer lifespans and everything else? Well, if you look at the statistics, all the major benefits that have accrued to expectant life and so forth have the ma major amount has been contributed to by public health measures, preventative measures like sewage, sewage disposal, clean water, all these things that help, again, your own body so you're not ingesting all the toxins, and I'm not saying toxins as chemical toxins, but bacterial toxins and everything else by proper uh, sanitation have done more for the extension of our lifespans than the medication. And I read a report not that long ago said the actual amount of time that is benefited by these non-health uh, environmental changes, the, the uh, clean water, the clean, or the sewage disposal, is, has only amounted to about two years of extended lifespan. 
This is part of my lecture this afternoon. You have these monosaccharides. They have to come into a cell. They have to go through all the little work that every cell does. They come out, and there's those eight monosaccharides attaching onto the protein. And this is where the communication occurs from one cell to another. And people ask me, well, gee whiz, you know, why, why don't, uh, or why didn't research come up with this before? And the simple answer is we did not have the tools to identify these things till about 10 or 12 years ago. These are normal cells. And you see, they're not just like little ping pong balls. They got receptors on them, all these things. And on the end of these, which we couldn't see before, were the carbohydrates. And only recently has medicine and the technology evolved. And as you can see, each one of these, but this is one of those carbohydrate things. These little fellows attached onto these, and that is where all the communication goes. And they're so minute, they're at the molecular level. Medicine and medical technology just couldn't identify them before. These monosaccharides, the eight are necessary, the phytosterols, the phytonutrients, phytochemicals, are only developed by plants, ripen plants not green harvested plants. The plants develop these. Your body is designed to incorporate these into your nutritional system, then they can be utilized. Drug companies, and one of my classmates is the head of one of these pharmaceutical uh, companies that wants to produce uh, sweet medicine, as they call it. And this has been written up in, let me see here, yeah, in a scientific American. Sweet medicine, drug companies are trying to develop pharmaceutical agents based on sugars because they have recognized and they've spent tens of millions and billions of dollars trying to develop artificial therapies, artificial sugar molecules for therapy. Uh, we all know, and I'm sure you've all heard about the HRT hormone replacement problems that have been published just recently. For 40, 45 years, we were told, physicians were told by the pharmaceuticals, the physicians told their patients, oh, take hormone replacement therapy. It is good for you. It's going to prevent osteoporosis. It's going to prevent cancer. It's going to prevent heart disease, which sounded very theoretically very possible. However, all the hormones in the hormone replacement are not natural. They were synthetically modified to become patentable, which then could be uh, turned into profit by the pharmaceutical company. Well, after accepting this for 40 some odd years, suddenly they do a proper uh, epidemiological study and they find that what they've been saying for 40 years is absolute hogwash. It does not prevent cancer. In fact, it increases the rates of certain cancers. It does not prevent heart disease. It increases the rates of some types of heart disease. It does not prevent osteoporosis. It may slow down the process, but it does not prevent it. So on an assumption that you know, us humans thought we knew more than our creator, we created all kinds of problems. We created difficulties. Now, the critics of what I'm saying will say, oh, yeah, but that's only, you know, eight people in so many thousand. Well, that's fine, but if you're one of those eight people that gets a uterine cancer, that's pretty devastating. Why should we contribute to the uh, demise or to the unhealthy state of humans? And as this tour is called, first, do no harm. And that is my message to physicians. Look look at stuff, do no harm. That's what we take, that's part of our oath. I took that oath and that's in the classic Hippocratic Oath. They've removed that from one of the modern versions, but the classic Hippocratic Oath that I so fervently believe in and I, I took when I graduated, first do no harm. And I want physicians, I want healthcare practitioners to listen to that oath. If you truly believe what you're in medicine or what you're in the healthcare field for is to help people. First, do no harm. Look at stuff. Investigate. Read up. And if you say, well, I have no time. And if you have that attitude, you have no business taking care of people because people rely on you. People come to you, trust you for, you know, if you don't have all the latest 
you know, technology, all the latest research, everything, you're abrogating the oath that you've taken. So these products, these supplements, do everything for cells. They help in cellular support, cellular replication, immune system support, mucosal uh, uh, support. You know, if cells can't stick or bacteria can't stick onto a cell, they can't cause a condition. They'll just go out. They'll, they'll be excreted. Bowel ecology. All the things that your cells do get benefit from proper nutrition. Pharmaceutical preparations alter, interfere with, block, or somehow change normal physiological processes. What nutrition does when taken proper nutrition, which we can't get in our modern diets anymore, in our westernized diets, they help every cell support it, they, they, they help the replication, they help the cellular communication, they help the ability of cells to interact properly, and this is what proper uh, nutrition does. And there's many, 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 and unfortunately, I, I've, again, I'll talk about all this stuff this afternoon, but there's many uh, conditions. You know, these, these products aren't made to cure, ameliorate, or change, or do anything to any disease. But they do, and we know scientifically that proper nutrition can, uh, or health, cellular health, can be benefited by, by proper nutrition. Thank you very much for listening.